All right. Uh, good evening. This is United Medical ACO. Uh, today is our Wednesday wellness webinar, uh, December 14th. Uh, my name is Kamal Erkan. I'm the chairman of the program, and I'm here with Caroline uh, Weber and Donna Gunkel. Uh, guys, how are you doing? Very well, thank you. All right. So this is our... Um, uh, twice a month event. Uh, so we are going to discuss diabetes and today specifically we are going to discuss the um, uh, managing diabetes during the holiday season and Caroline is going to help us with that. So but before that I do want to make sure that we uh, introduce our other members. Uh, so hopefully everything is visible there. So I'm just double checking from here. All right, so uh, Dr. Ripu Handal uh, from uh, State Endo is our program director. Um, uh, Tim Maku is uh, our physical therapist. Caroline is our uh, dietitian in charge of the program. And uh, Roxana Portlock is uh, the social worker who's part of the program. So as I mentioned, we are going to discuss um, the uh, diabetes management during the holiday season. So I will have Caroline to go. From here. Thank you. So diabetes um, during the holiday season has been a topic that has been discussed a lot in patient appointments uh, this, this month and whole since November. So it's really nice to be able to talk about it and ways we can navigate the holiday season and maintain our blood sugar levels because it takes some effort. It takes um, some care to manage it. So uh, we'll dive right into ham, potato, and pie. Oh my, it can get pretty intense when you have all these different kinds of foods that you feel like you have to avoid. Um, so why is it so difficult to maintain those blood sugar ranges during the holidays? Of course, the food. Um, but we also have to take into account that we're managing different stress levels. Our routines are changing. Um, our physical activity levels are changing. Even our hydration takes, takes impacted um, during holiday season. So uh, we'll go over a couple tips for our holiday game plan to help manage um, our diabetes well. So step one is creating a game plan. So it can be overwhelming if you just kind of go into the holidays and you feel overwhelmed by the amount of food and cookies and cakes and celebratory events going on. So um, creating a game plan is our first step. So what do we keep in our game plan? Um, you can head on to, perfect, keeping a normal schedule. That is our first step. Um, eating as close as we can to usual meal times, it can be difficult, especially if you were to think back on Thanksgiving. When I grew up, we, you know, fasted the whole day and then kind of ate in excess at nighttime. We really don't want to do that for um, diabetes. We want to make sure that we're having small incremental snacks throughout the day to maintain your blood sugar levels, not, you know, just starting before the meal, but actually it helps for the meal itself, the bigger meal that you have with friends and family. Um, even if you do skip meals, right, your liver keeps releasing that sugar into your bloodstream, which could give you a higher blood sugar before you even start to eat your main meal of the day. So trying to eat as close as you can to normal meal times to keep steady blood sugars throughout the day, um, not skipping meals, because then we end up maybe even overeating, you know, at nighttime or at the big lunch that you have on um, your holiday schedule. So trying not to skip those meals. Um, planning snacks. So I'm a big advocate of good snacking. Um, the key with good snacking would be having a good protein source mixed with your carbohydrate so that you have steady breakdown throughout the time between your meals and snacks. So there are good snacks to have um, throughout the day. So that way we don't overeat at dinner time because we're not as hungry. Um, and then even if you're going out, like if you're going to a friend's house for a celebration, um, offering to bring a healthy dish or maybe a food that you feel like you can, you know, rely heavy on to keep your blood sugar stable, maybe a protein focused snack um, or appetizer that you can, you know, go to if you're feeling a little peckish before mealtime. Our next option is to focus on hydration. So I've heard a lot today that it's been harder to hydrate with the colder weather, which I, I actually agree with because it's I have to remind myself to drink because I'm not getting as thirsty as often. Um, but we know that high blood sugar can lead to dehydration. We know that there's a link between dehydration and high blood sugar. So making sure we stay hydrated throughout the day to help bring those sugars back um, into a level place. 
Um, also, you know, having uh, a high carbohydrate meal, when you drink water, you're diluting your bloodstream directly with, um, with that fluid. So that helps to decrease your blood sugar overall too. Um, thirst, we know diabetes is not always a good indicator on if you're um, dehydrated or not. So I think, I actually think there's a statistic I forget where I'd heard it, but the fact that you're thirsty means you're already past that point of dehydration. So um, staying regular with your fluid intake throughout the day in small amounts is really beneficial. Um, we have a goal, a goal for hydration. We say it starting around 48 to 64 ounces, but it really differs for some people. There are recommendations for you know 64 ounces above 100 ounces gallon, drink half your body weight. It really depends on the person um, or your hydration needs. Like if you exercise heavily, you'll want to drink more. Um, but 48 to 64 ounces is just for our minimal hydration needs to make sure we're um, replenishing any fluid that we lose through the day. Um, but keys to switch up your fluid hydration sources, you want to make sure that you could include, you know, water, regular water, flavored water, seltzer water, it all counts. So you could make, it doesn't have to be boring. You could make it interesting by adding a splash of flavored seltzer. You know, I just had a cranberry orange one and it was really holiday festive. Um, so you can make it interesting to stay hydrated through the day. And our next step of the game plan will be probably one of the hardest, in my opinion, is practicing portion sizing. Um, I'm a eyes bigger than my stomach type of person. <laughs> so um, trying with this first step to not sit by the buffet table or the spread of food, uh, getting your plate, making it up, moving yourself away from the food. Cause I don't know about you guys, but if I'm talking, I'm grabbing snacks and eating them and kind of lose track of, of what my consumption has been. Um, so try not to sit, removing yourself away from the food access. That way you can sit down, focus on the meal in front of you rather than filling up on additional portions and not keeping track. Um, practicing with a small plate is actually entirely helpful. Uh, I've tried it myself. It's really fantastic because sometimes your brain and your stomach need to connect. So when you see an empty plate, right, you feel full. Um, there was actually a really great study done. Um, I'm not sure of the year, but they had two groups. One group had a regular bowl of soup and were in charge of eating that bowl of soup. The other group had the bowl of soup, but it would refill every time it would get to a certain point. The, the participants had no clue. Um, they found that the people who had the regular bowl of soup finished it and felt full, but the people who had the refilling bowl of soup kept eating because their brains didn't register that they were full. So practicing with a small plate can help you kind of take less on your plate, have you finish, and then see and determine if you still feel hungry um, and you'll consume less food overall, which would be more beneficial for your blood sugar as in having it, you know, in excess or overeating like we tend to do on holidays sometimes. Um, but it does take your brain some time to recognize that you are full. So your brain and stomach, they got to connect signals. So it might take upwards of 20 minutes for you to feel, you know, the complete level of fullness. So if we skip the whole meal all day and then we go into dinner time for the big meal, right? We'll eat really fast because we've been hungry. And then we might overeat and not realize that we were full maybe 10 minutes ago. Um, so slowing it down, we always talk about some mindful eating, um, sitting down, savoring, enjoying the foods you have. Um, but one other way you can prevent overeating would be loading up on non-starchy vegetables. So they're great. We know vegetables have wonderful fiber components and vitamins and minerals in it. But they're also really good for taking the curb off that hunger. So if you, maybe you did skip a bunch of meals during the day and you don't want to overeat on the starchy foods that raise our blood sugar, you could feel free to load up on those non-starchy vegetables to kind of take the curb off your hunger so you can focus more on the portion sizing of your protein and your carbohydrates. Um, sweet treat tip, if you plan on having, you know, a dessert item as we do on holidays, um, after your meal, try to measure out the carbs that you're having at the meal. So maybe decreasing the total bread or potato or fruit consumption during that meal so that you can account for some blood sugar stability if you're going to indulge in the cookie, cakes, or pies. So since that was the hardest one, um, there is a good visual here for practicing portion sizing, which I think is important to note since you know, maybe it's easier on other days to practice portion sizing, but when you're surrounded by family and friends who have bigger plates than you and you're kind of talking and eating and celebrating, we want to at least make sure we're including a good proportion of each type of food on that plate. So as you can see, this it's more of a my like a my plate visual. So you've got 
um, primarily some non-starchy vegetables, but you've got some more varieties on your plate than you normally would have at a regular dinner time meal. So you have two types of vegetables. You've got your favorite starches on there, still only taking up about like a quarter of the plate. And then you've got a really good source of protein as well. So all these three in combination create a nice stable blood sugar, less likely to have a blood sugar spike because you're collaborating with your different food types um, to help stabilize um, your blood sugar by slowing down digestion. So it's not, you know, a quick influx of sugar. Um, so really love these visuals because all of our plates tend to look a little different. All the holiday foods tend to differ, but if you stick with your vegetable, a little bit of carb, and then your protein, you really can't go wrong. Um, but there is a way to fit in our favorites. So I always preach this because holidays are meant to be enjoyed, right? Food is meant to be enjoyed. So ways we can fit in our favorites, because I get a lot of questions on like, do I have to like stay away from grandma Sue's pie, like the favorite items on the list? And the answer is no, you don't have to. Um, no food is on the naughty list. Um, we can pair things together, like we've talked about with portion sizing. So choosing your favorite foods is the first step. Limited edition foods that you're not going to see, you know, the rest of the year, like grandma Sue's pie, or maybe it's, you know, um, I know the stuffing is always my favorite at Thanksgiving. So I always tend to go for that first. So choosing your favorites um, and then being mindful. So you know that that food's going to raise your blood sugar. So you're going to start out with the moderate portion of it and you're going to sit, savor and enjoy. So we spend time slowing down, having an experience and intentionality, intentionality with your food so that you're less likely to overeat and that you feel satisfied on it. Um, a lot of the times when we eat pretty quickly on these, on these high carbohydrate foods, we kind of miss out on the mental satisfaction of it. So that's why you might be hungry after you've had a big meal. I know if I've I actually it was last week, I was sitting in front of the TV and I was eating. And then after I ate this big meal, I was hungry and I was confused on why am I hungry if I just ate this big meal? But it's because I didn't take the time to kind of sit down, acknowledge the flavors and the taste. Um, I was just kind of distracted eating. So the more we can be mindful and present in the moment of eating, the more satisfied you'll feel physically and mentally um, and less likely to kind of overindulge in those foods later on. Um, but one of the most important, I think, would be to keep moving. So we often forget that moving plays an int intentional role in lowering our blood sugar. So it is our secret weapon for the holiday season because, I mean, it flies right out the window for priorities sometimes because you're busy cooking, you've got family and friends over. So it takes a backseat sometimes, um, but it's our secret weapon to use. So it does more than just balance your blood sugar or, you know, promote weight loss, right? It reduces our stress, um, lowers our blood sugar initially, especially, you know, there's been great studies five to 10 minutes after a meal. If you take a walk, your blood sugar directly starts to fall. Um, improved energy levels, right? After a walk, you kind of build those feel good endorphins um, and you can incorporate friends and family. So if that's kind of a barrier for you, bring everybody with you. Or if it's too cold outside, you know, walk around the house, try not to be sedentary after maybe a big meal that you've had to celebrate with friends and family. Um, but staying mobile is one of the best things you can do to help reduce your blood sugar. Um, so that is probably one of my most key important ones to focus on this holiday because I even struggle with it because you eat a lot and then you just want to sit down, but actually kind of making sure you're moving, doing intentional movement and involving friends and family is super helpful to maintain those blood sugar levels. One I think we often forget is the next tip for our game plan and that is sleep. Um, a lot of the time your priorities of cooking, planning, getting ready for a family at the holidays. Um, so managing our blood sugars becomes more difficult when we're sleep deprived. Um, I don't know about you guys, but if, if I have not slept, I crave all the things that are crunchy and sugary. Um, and I want to have snacky foods. Um, so that is why sleeping is fantastic because it reduces your stress level. You have better intentions with food, right? You can think more clearly. It actually reduces high fat and sugar cravings. Um, but normally we try to aim for seven to eight hours per night um, to guard against kind of that mindless eating. Um, but honestly, follow your normal sleep schedule, right? So if you're, you know, you sleep six or seven hours a night and you're cool with that and that's how your body functions, so keep that consistency rather than, you know, lessening the time to four or five hours, which could kind of impact those blood sugar levels. Um, so get your sleep around the holidays. It's going to benefit your blood sugar um, and your sanity. Sleep is good. Um, and then I think our biggest topic, 
which I get questions about a lot, um, is being mindful with our alcohol consumption. So alcohol impacts our blood sugar. Um, but on one hand, drinking alcohol and especially on an empty stomach, um, can actually cause a drop in your blood sugar. There's a couple reasons why. So the liver, when you drink alcohol, stops releasing that glucose into your blood. That's usually you think, Hey, that's a good thing. I have diabetes. I don't want more glucose in my blood. Right. Um, but not so good if you've had a couple drinks and you haven't eaten anything in a while. Second, the liver has a main priority to break down alcohol. So that is less harmful to your body. So while it's busy doing all that work, it isn't paying that much attention to kind of what your blood sugars are doing. Um, if you drink on a regular basis, those glucose stores are also quickly depleted too. So if your blood sugar level drops, the liver is basically kind of powerless to release that glucose to help. Um, so especially if you take certain medications like insulin or certain diabetic pills, right. To lower your blood sugar, um, you're already predisposed to hypoglycemia. So you want to make sure that you know your risks, which is why we want to make sure when you're figuring out what's a serving size for you, what is a moderation to talk to your healthcare provider, um, your healthcare provider can really take into consideration your risk factors, um, the presence of, if you're already prone to hypoglycemia, certain medications, or even other health complications you might have. So talking with your provider will really help figure out what's that moderation size, um, based on, you know, the American Diabetes Association, Heart Association, all those associations up to one drink, um, per day per women for women. And then up to two drinks per day for men is defined as moderation or a serving size of alcohol. Um, but there are good choices. So if I'm talking to patients, right. And we need to decide what's this, like a, a route you want to go with alcohol for the season. You want a safe way to consume it. We talk about some of the best alcohols to have for blood sugar management, because there are certain alcohols that will raise your blood sugar way more. Um, the best options, um, as you can see on this chart would be distilled spirits, um, champagne, drier wines, usually because they have less sugar residual in it. Um, so avoiding or limiting those higher sugar options, like, um, like frozen drinks, those mixers tend to be an issue. Um, you think, Hey, to prevent, you know, hypoglycemia, I could just have like a sugary mixture and give myself some, some extra sugar. Right. Um, but sadly they don't offer too much protection because that sugar is digested so fast. You're not going to get any residual effect from it. Right. So um, we want to make sure that if you choose to have alcohol during your holiday season, that you choose one that might support your blood sugar a little better. Um, try mixers that are, you know, calorie sugar free club sodas, those types of things, um, and limit those high sugary drinks, especially if you um, are, you know, having multiple drinks in a day. So be aware of your medications, talk to your doctor um, or your diabetes educator on, on what you want to do, what's your game plan, right? And especially advised to eat when you drink. Um, having something with a carb, protein, maybe even a little fat in there reduces your risk of hypoglycemia immensely because you're already having that prolonged breakdown of, of food in your system. Um, also a good idea not to kind of, you know, skip the carb at the meal if you plan on having alcohol instead, right? We know that carb in a meal and carb um, or protein in a meal and a fat in a meal create good satiety and have a longer breakdown period. So we want to make sure that you're um, balancing that out and then introducing alcohol if you choose to have alcohol during your holiday celebrations. Um, and as always, please, please, please check your blood sugars. Um, we don't know what's happening until you check your blood sugars. It's um, It can be kind of disruptive. Sometimes you might think if I have to check it multiple times at a party, but it's only going to do you much better because say you check your blood sugar, um, before a meal, right. And you notice it's high that will help you determine to make decisions on what carb choices to choose, how much to eat. Um, especially if you're on insulin as well. So if you're figuring out carb to insulin ratios, um, but we also don't want to, you know, skip out on anything. So making sure that you, um, making sure that you always find something to pair with your carbohydrates. So you have that sustained breakdown. Um, so checking your blood sugar regularly helps you prevent, you know, hypoglycemia or hyperglycemia, um, results. So that's the best way that you can stay in tune with what your body is doing, especially during a holiday celebration. So some key reminders as we enter into, I mean, we're coming to the end of the holiday season, but as we, uh, go through the holiday season is to monitor those glucose. We don't 
want our number, even if you think your numbers are going to be high and you don't want to check it, it helps you troubleshoot. You could find that they're high, drink some water, take a short walk, and that will help lower them. So be in control of monitoring your glucose. Um, you don't always need a healthy substitute. So a lot of the time, um, it's not bad to choose something for as a healthy substitute to kind of have less carbohydrate density in your meal, right? But you don't need to. So if this is a food you really enjoy and you don't want a healthy substitute, um, that's okay. Sometimes they don't taste good. Sometimes while they're new, more nutritionally beneficial, it doesn't satisfy that craving in your head. So if you are like me and need to eat that one food in order to feel satisfied rather than searching for 10 other things to fill that place, then it might be okay just for you to sit down and enjoy and mindfully eat that one food that you want to enjoy, even if it is not the healthiest um, or most nutrient dense uh, food that you have that supports good blood sugar. When you add mindfulness to that, then it becomes a safe option for your managing of your blood sugar. Um, so you don't always need a healthy substitute, but they are good to have options, right? Think about what you want at your holiday meal. Um, and then I always advise don't celebrate too long, enjoy the holiday. So um, one day is not going to impact your progress. Uh, I always encourage to spend the time with family, friends, um, having a low stress level because stress we know increases our blood sugar, uh, but moderation is key. So this is not me saying eat a whole pie by yourself. This is me saying, <laughs> um, enjoy your time during that day. But if it comes to the leftovers, work on that portion sizing technique, check your blood sugars, stay active. Um, all the tools we went through for our game plan. Um, and with this game plan, it's holiday proof. Um, it should be hopefully low stress, but also give you good results with your blood sugar too. So um, Caroline, everything you said is so great. No problem there. Uh, so then you come to your office. And oh, he's got goodies. <laughs> so, goodies, right? So, chocolate, goodies. more chocolate, popcorn, more popcorn. <laughs> um, thank you, Kyle. Uh, Kyle Bain. <laughs> so, uh, this is how we are pleasing um, others. And just this is just from today. Um, I can see how that would be problematic. <laughs> well, it's another one, and this is from Jim Bradford, district manager. Okay, so um, we already started eating this, so I didn't. But so then um, there were a couple, a couple of cookies before um, the boxes and all the stuff. So. The, there is this, uh, and we actually have this discussion with the Bariatric Friday uh, with Dr. Ergao because the issue is kind of similar. So how we are going to actually go through not just the time that we have now, but uh, like the, with the holidays, but also uh, like overall, like how we are actually celebrating. So celebration is kind of like centered in uh, food. And I think, I think there's some, in my opinion, and I may be totally... Um, uh, I don't want our program to get in trouble for this, but um, I think there is a psychological problem in, in the society with the way that we are celebrating. And I mean, this is great, of course, you know, getting chocolate for someone, getting cookies, but then uh, the person who's on the other side, who on the receiving side, who's having other issues, like it's a tough, you know, tough decision to not to touch these things all day, yeah. right? Yeah. So um, I think there's that part. So like, how would how do you think we would actually get through that? So um, I got a similar question like that today. Um, I normally ask, like, do you feel out of control when you're around these foods? Right. Do you? Yeah. Like it's, it's <laughs> common. Right. If you're faced with like all your favorites, it's sugar. I've, I'm a huge. I love chocolate. Or, do you feel out of control with that? Um, and then we kind of break it down. So the reason that you might feel out of control around certain foods is because you've had a restrictive mindset physically or mentally about it saying, I can't have these things. These things cause this. Um, and when we feel we don't have that restriction barrier, you're, you're more having that food neutrality aspect. So you're looking at it and you're like, okay, I see it's there. I can have a bite, but not feel like I'm going to overindulge in it because I know what it tastes like. I can have it anytime. Um, it's a process. So it, it takes some time to get there. You can't just say, all right, I feel fine. I'm not restricting. It takes 
some time to kind of break those food rules um, down so that you can have food neutrality, looking at it, not feeling as tempted, but you can have it anytime you want. There's nothing wrong with that food. Um, so it's a process to get there for sure. Um, but I also, oh, sorry. No, no, you go ahead. Go ahead. No, I was going to say, I, you know, it's one thing like come also when you're given this stuff, right? Mm-hmm. So sometimes we have our own choice when we go to the grocery store, if we know that we're, we can't have a bag of whatever, um, in the house, like I like Reese's. So if I know that I would be tempted to eat them all, right. You just don't buy them. Yes. But it's different when you go to a party and it's there or when someone sends you something, yeah, you don't have to eat it. But again, it's that temptation, yeah, right? It's like, oh, I, oh I really it. like it. It's over here. Um, so I'm going to have some. That's where I think, you know, it it does impact us. Or being at the, the buffet where you're saying sit away from it or, yeah. you know, only take, you know, one thing that's your favorite and then try to, you know, utilize other good options um, there. I'm a grazer. So I'm like you, Same. if I'm there and you have a buffet of things or even at someone's house and they have the food out. Yes. It's like, Oh, I only had one, but I had one 10 times. Right. Versus yeah. taking that small plate and, and moving on. So they are things. And I I'm hoping, right. That this message will help people with, again, being more mindful, thinking about those things. Um, Sometimes I know when people feel like they have the temptation and they're given those types of things, what do we do? Sometimes we take it to work, right? Well, I don't want it in my house. So I take it to Sharing work and caring. put it out there. <laughs> yeah, that's, 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 that's a good point. Sharing is, is a great option too. Um, it really depends on the way your brain works since we're all entirely different in the way that we think things that are triggering for us, right? If it helps to keep those foods out of eyesight, right? If I keep snacks on my desk, I will eat them all day because mm-hmm. they're here. Right. And I'm, right. I'm not recognizing that I'm not eating out of hunger. I'm eating out of the availability of it. So checking in, Hey, am I hungry for this? Do I really want this right now? Right. Having an internal dialogue about the food choices that you make is not bad. Um, but if it helps to separate it out of an entire di- different section of your house, if it helps not to keep it in the house, um, leftovers, right? Maybe if you're building leftovers, you pick the things that you want to have in your house a little bit longer. Um, so it, it really depends on the person and we try to work it around individually. That I can reach, um, that's my approach. Like at home, I know I'm safe because you know what I can get there is, I think one of the maybe, like uh, I do mention this in a couple other sessions, uh, but like going to a party uh, probably is one of the, uh, challenging one. And I don't know how this would be okay with the diabetes or not. So you can tell me sure. it's not, but having like a couple, uh, like, um, uh, egg whites before you yeah. go on it, that it definitely does help. Uh, and do you think that's also, I just- think that's totally fine. The concept I like there, and you're choosing a protein. So that would be very good for uh, diabetes management too. So you'd want to grab something beforehand so that you're not starving, right? So that that food becomes a little less exciting when you get to the party. So you're not grabbing everything, overfilling your plate. You've taken the curb off the hunger. So you're more able to focus on specific food choices. So like we always talk about um, maybe having like, if you have those small little snacks through the day, if you plan on having a big meal, but you don't want to overfill yourself to like not be hungry for the big meal, have some small little snacks here and there. Um, protein based with a little bit of carb is great. Even if it is just a handful of nuts beforehand, that really is helpful. Um, and then it gets your blood sugar in a nice stable range. So if you're looking at the buffet, right. And it's like super overwhelming. Cause I know if I see a lot of food, I'm overwhelmed, um, search for your protein item first, right. Find that protein. Cause that's going to be integral for managing any blood sugar rise from a carb. So find your protein fill in with vegetables in a good portion, but then find your favorite carbs and fill in. But you know, you've taken care of the protein, the vegetables, and now you can pick out your favorite carbs that you want to enjoy for the night. I think the part of it is like the, the anticipation of food. Like um, if you are going to a party and then the idea of uh, that party is that you're going to eat a lot or mm-hmm. you're going to have a lot of good food versus like, um, you know, I think uh, what I see with um Diabetes is kind of like similar when we talk about uh, sleep behavior, like sleep disorder or uh, sleep inconsistencies. The best is kind of to keep doing the same thing uh, that you are doing on those days. Like people with the sleep disorder, if uh, 
they change their sleeping behavior on the weekend, the weekdays are always more difficult. So like if you get up at seven every weekdays, if you now get up at 11, 12 in, on the weekends, that does impact your next uh, weekday, the following weekdays. So there's some consistency problem, I guess, is something that we kind of psychologically we really need to um, uh, figure it out so that we know that this is not something that we need to fight for. So then this is uh, like if you, and uh, you know, I'm saying all this doesn't mean that I'm doing all these. Um, <laughs> Consistency so, and persistence, they're don't very helpful. Do what I say, but don't, don't do what I do, right? <laughs> um, you have a good point because it's practice, right? So you don't, you might not make it into this holiday season and feel like you're in full, like good capacity to make all these great decisions, right? It's taking one little small change at a time. So one that you feel you struggle with the most, like mine would be portion sizing. That would be my biggest struggle at the holiday season. So I'm going to really focus on that. Right. If you feel you struggle with maintaining your sleep habits during the holidays, that's your thing to focus on. And it's okay if you take it one at a time, for sure. Yep. So I think, uh, you know, getting psychologically getting ready for these um, and then just just handling this in a different way. Like, okay, this is not a big deal. I think that approach does help. Um, And uh, I mean, Donna knows uh, me for a long time and you do, too. But I, I think we spend more time on different events. I try not to eat at, the, at these events just because usually I have already taken care of that before I leave the house. <laughs> and it does help. It does help. Um, so, and I think one other thing that I want to mention, uh, and because we do our case conferences um, uh, on a daily basis, um, what we realize um, every day, understanding that this, especially diseases like diabetes, uh, chronic illnesses, these are um, not individual individual problems or problems for individual. It needs to be like the family members, uh, household people need, really needs to know, uh, they need to be educated with uh, what's happening. So like you know, my mom uh, who has diabetes, so if other people in the household don't really know what's happening in her, in her world, that's a huge problem. So like, uh, just kind of like making sure that everyone understands um, this is true with the morbid obesity. Like if mm-hmm. uh, you may have, um, you know, uh, family members who are struggling with that. And then if you just eat, like um, there is no uh, issue for anyone in front of them, that's not going to work, right? So it's kind of like the approach that we see, we want to see is uh, the, at least the household members are educated with these problems, with these, with these disease. So I think that also helps to overcome some of the problems. I agree. I think yeah. having, we call it a, like a wingman or wing woman at, at like a holiday gathering, especially like if you decide, say you're going to decide to have an alcoholic beverage, you'll want to let someone know, like who knows that you have diabetes, right? So if some event were to happen, they know if your blood sugar drops to get you orange juice, right? that 15, 15 minute rule, or, um, if, Hey, like I, if I disappear for a few minutes and I don't come back, Hey, let, let me know. I'm just taking care of my blood sugars. Um, so it's important definitely to have that communication, um, especially during a big gathering, especially if there are a lot of people there so that you, nothing gets kind of missed. Absolutely. I, I think also with the mindful part is to Kamal's point, whether it's sweets or things, you know, that, that a diabetic may need to be more mindful of certain carbohydrates or someone, um, you know, struggling with their weight and they're trying to, to do weight management. Yeah. If you're the person that's, you know, you eat out all the time and you're bringing that food in, it is hard to keep them motivated. It doesn't mean you can't eat any of that food, but just being mindful, being around them, if they're sitting there eating a salad and you're bringing in your you know, whatever, Chick-fil-A, your pe- um, oh, she grows. <laughs> the house all the time or their favorite dessert in the house or chocolate, you know, again, it's just being supportive. Yes. Supportive. Absolutely. I agree. Um, and keeping that in mind. So you don't want to tell them they can't have it at all, but you don't want to make it so readily available if they're having trouble, um, you know, with, the control, right? Sometimes we all have that issue, but if it's always in front of us, it's even more difficult. Absolutely. 
Well, um, so hopefully uh, people can benefit from these uh, discussions that we have. Um, but, you know, like uh, when you see these discussions, um, but sometimes people are struggling and then they want to hear this in a different way. And I think it does help uh, for those individuals uh, when they can open uh, open up one of these and listen to them, listen to us. And, uh, and hopefully that would be the support that they need in those or maybe the reminder that they need. Um, so we'll be here. Uh, so this is our uh, last event for this year, Anna, or do we have one more event for the support group? We have the support group on the 28th of December. Right? Uh, so then um, right now uh, we updated on our website, uh, the, uh, the link is there. So then people can actually uh, register for those events ahead of time. Um, and then we added for a couple of our clients' websites, if we manage the website, so it's added to their website. Uh, I'm hoping uh, we finished that already, but uh, it's easily available for those uh, who can who wants to register for a support group. Uh, and also, don't forget, we have the new posters um, with the QR code. So we are trying to get that out into some of our um, practice offices. So um, I did give them to Dr. Hundel. Um, the head of our program. So um, he has them now in his offices. Uh, we've put them in some of our PCP offices and we'll continue to distribute those and see how that goes. But it's just another easy way. You scan the QR code, it takes you right to um, the link where you can register directly. Also have the links to get to our webinars um, and some of our other um, you know, handouts and other educational materials. So again, just trying to make everything easily accessible um, for all of our patients. Um, and then Caroline and Kamal and I have been uh, starting to work on our list of topics for 2023. Um, so um, we are currently uh, in the process of um, finalizing uh, some of those for the first quarter and also getting our guest speakers lined up. All right, so we'll be busy in 2023, and then we'll see you guys on the support um, group meeting on the 28th. Mm -hmm. uh, so, well, in between, there's Christmas, so uh, Merry <laughs> Christmas. Uh, we'll see you soon. Thank you for joining us. Thanks. Thank you.